By His Word, God created all things. Get ready to be recreated and repositioned for greatness as you listen to this inspiring message by Pastor Wale Afelomo. Open your spirit and let the Word of God give you light and fresh inspiration. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you speak to our hearts as we approach the perfect law of liberty. Lord, I ask that the spirit of breakthrough will rest upon this assembly in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that you will speak specifically to a man, speak specifically to a woman, to a family here in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask that through this series, you will empower somebody in the name of Jesus. Cause me to speak as your oracles. Cause my mind to be quick and nimble. Help me to speak as your oracles in the name of Jesus. I ask that your glory will fill this house and your name will be glorified. In Jesus' name, we pray. I said, in Jesus' name, we pray. Verse 1, when Abraham, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God. That's El Shaddai, the one we just sang about now. El Shaddai means the all-sufficient one. It's from the Hebrew word that means the many-breasted one. The many-breasted one. El Shaddai says, walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you. And will multiply you exceedingly. And if you go to verse 7, it says, And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants. After you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants. I will establish Deuteronomy 8.18. 8, I will establish my covenant. I will. I want you to remember that phrase. He said, I will establish my covenant to you and to your descendants. Deuteronomy 8 and 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Somebody say power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant. You, you, can you see the connection right now? That he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is this day in the name of Jesus. Now it gets sweeter. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 19. It was written by the richest man that ever lived. Ecclesiastes 10, 19. A feast is made for laughter. A feast is made for laughter. And wine makes merry. Merry there just means it makes you to be smiling when there's no reason to smile. Wine can make you cross a gutter when there's no gutter there. A feast is made for laughter and wine makes merry. But money answers everything. But money answers everything. If you doubt that, let's go to verse chapter 9. Just flip a page backward. Chapter 9 and verse 13. This wisdom I have also seen under the sun and it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it and a great king came against it, besieged it and built snares around it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that same poor man. Then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. And his words are not heard. And his words are not heard. A poor man's wisdom. This man had wisdom. Strategy. He was a strategist. To deliver the nation or the city. But everybody forgot about him. Solomon said, I looked and I learned that a poor man's wisdom is despised. Now, last week we began to, uh, uh, well, two weeks ago, and I began to talk about uh, laying the foundation for uh, money, like I said. And last week we realized that money is ultimately a function of value. And as its root, at its roots, it's exchange. At its root, it's exchange. Money is not the paper we carry in our hands. That is just a promissory note. It is a medium of exchange. So money is not the paper that we carry in our hands. We also heard that last week. Money is what we give as an equivalent for the value that we get. Money is what we give as an equivalent for the value that we get. 
And it is also what we receive for the value that we give. It's the same thing in a reverse way. So today what I'm talking about, I've titled it The Morality of Prosperity. Helping you to understand the need for money. So giving you a new perspective or an understanding of money. So I said again that money is ultimately what we give for the value, in exchange for the value, the equivalent value that we get. And it is what we receive for the value that we give. Interestingly, the British pound has this written on it. I promise to pay to the bearer on demand the sum of, if you can help me project that British pound. Let it be prophecy for somebody. I, I, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of, that is it up there. And that has always, you know, bothered me. So let's, this is 10 pounds. So it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of 10 pounds. And I'm like, it's my, I already have the money. Why is the bearer, why, why is the person paying the bearer the money? Because I already have the money. And then when you look at that, you realize what the pound is saying to you is that what you have in your hand is not the real money. It is the value that you are going to get that is the real money. In other words, if I have value worth 20 pounds and you have 20 pounds, I am actually the one with money because eventually that money will exchange hands to me. So it says, pay the bearer on demand. So you are giving him the equivalent of the money that he gives to you. Now look at it like this. Like Mr. Goyega said last week, it also supposes that the person who has value is actually richer than the person who has money. Because really, if let's say it's a wheelbarrow boy at the market. I bought my things and I've finished a market and I only have 20 naira or 50 naira or 100 naira left on me. And uh, I say, how much will it cost you to push this thing to the gate? He says, 100 naira. So I give him because he has value that he's given me. And I exhaust that money. But because he has that value, that wheelbarrow, he can also provide, always provide that service for more people. I have gotten that value, lost in quote my 100 naira. But with that value he can create or provide, he can get more hundred nairas from several other customers. Because he has the value. So more people will keep coming to him. Are you following me? So he says, pay the bearer on demand the sum. So it's really not about the money. Now, let me say that the spirit of religion hates it when we talk about money in church. The spirit of religion is not a Christian spirit. Hates it when we talk about money in church. But like we also heard last week, all week, that's what we pursue. In fact, some people are in church right now, they just, they are checking as that alert come. They just, after a while, they bring out the phone again. As it comes, that man promised to pay. Because all week, that's what we pursue. That's what we desire. That's what we work for. That what, that's what we exchange our time for all week. And so it is proper that we talk about it in church. The devil wants the message of the pulpit. But we should talk about it in the sanctity of the church because it is important. And I speak to those also watching uh, by uh, online or through the online or whatever. Praise God. Now, the devil fights the prosperity of the church and of Christians simply because the Bible says when the righteous prospers, the city rejoices. When the righteous prospers, the city rejoices. See how the wicked often prosper while the, wicked, while the righteous struggles. Or to, well, the righteous struggles to break even. Have you ever noticed that? In fact, in Psalm 73, David spoke about that. He said that, uh, God, you've been good to Israel. He said, but my feet almost stumbled when I consider the prosperity of the wicked. He says, they have no pangs in their death. Their cheeks swell with fatness. Uh, they are robust. Everything. He said, is it in vain that I have cleansed my hands? Is it in vain that I have cleansed my hands? So sometimes you just see the ungodly, money just easily follows them. And the Christian is struggling to break through or break even, even in business. Why? It is because the devil is the one who runs things here. Uh, we live in the realm that the Bible calls that the, the, the power operating here is the power of the prince of the air. And uh, maybe we'll understand that some more today or later in the course of the series. Now, money is the most powerful force in the earth realm. In this world system, money is a powerful force. It's a powerful force. There's a spirit behind money. And as Christians, Jesus Christ hinting that we popularly call it the spirit of mammon. The spirit of mammon. So it's a powerful force in this earth realm. 
The Bible says a man that gives a gift, say his gift has a lot of value to him because he can turn wherever he wants when he gives a gift. The spirit behind there is bribery, but it's also money. Now, that's in the negative way. So, it is a, it is a force that runs things in this earth realm. And so, Jesus Christ spoke about mammon, and as it were, he equated mammon with God. He says, you cannot serve God with mammon. Not with uh, uh, all these idols and gods we have in our villages. He says, no, mammon. Mammon. And what Jesus Christ was saying there is that as God is powerful in the realm of the spirit, mammon is also powerful in the realm of the physical. And if you are not careful and you get all physical, all natural, all carnal, you will find your allegiance swaying from God to mammon. And so it is a spirit that is behind money. And as you look around, you find that many people have sold their souls to mammon to be able to make money. So money is a powerful force. Anybody who undermines the place and the power of money is just simply ignorant. You're just being ignorant. Did you notice all the noise that uh, was generated in the body of Christ over tithing? Did you, uh, did you notice that? No, did you notice? Now talk with me. We need to preach all over the social media. Uh, people fighting one another. People accusing one another. People unfriending one another. Respected men of God fighting one another. People say it's of the Old Testament, of the New Testament, of grace, of the law. It is Melchizedek. It is Levi. And all of those things just being generated on social media. You know why? It's because it is money. Have you ever noticed that no other topic in the body of Christ has generated as much contention? None. Not even hell and heaven. Not righteousness. Not holiness. Not laying on of hands. Not falling in the spirit. Not the word of knowledge. Not prophecy. Not any of those things that we should concern about. Why? Because it is money. And the reason is because our English people will say, a miser hates to part with his money. It is because there is a reluctance to release that which we have. Because we think that something wants to take away from us. And anytime we feel that, we tighten our pockets. So it's really not about tithing. It's not, it's not about any of those things. It's just because it is money. It is money. Have you noticed that marriages are broken up because of money? Have you noticed that friendships have been dissolved because of money? Have you noticed that business partnerships have been dissolved because of money? Money is a powerful force. If you don't understand that, you are of all men the most ignorant. It is. It is. So you must understand that it has power, but you can have power over it. But you can have power over it. So a miser, the English people say, hates parting with his money. But a generous person is not into all of those. Like I read to us before, Isaiah 32, 8 says, A generous man devises generous things. He looks for ways to be generous. He doesn't care what, what, what it is called, whether it is called a tithe or a twentieth or a fifteenth or a first fruit or a, a, whatever. He looks for opportunities to be generous, to be a help, to be a blessing because of the spirit of generosity. Like I began to say, history has shown us the power of, of money that people would do all kinds of things for money have you seen delilah and samson she loved him they had a relationship but when money came into the equation she was ready to throw love away what is what is romance without finance so she just she betrayed the guy because of money because of money because of money you look at a man called king ahasuerus in the book of esther the king over persia he had 120 provinces under him the Bible says when Haman came to him, because of 10,000 10, talents of silver, he was willing to kill all the Jewish people. He said, kill all these people, I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the king's coffers. He said, go and kill all of them. You mean I'll get that amount? Go and kill all of them. Waste people's lives because of money. Judas. Judas. By the way, Judas was an apostle. Judas prayed for the sick. They were healed. All the miracles Jesus sent them to go and perform, Judas also did. But then when there was money, Judas was ready to abandon church, drop his uh, church membership certificate, what is basic, what is culture class, what is pastoral, what is praying in tongues. Please! He left all of those things for 30 pieces of silver. He betrayed the Son of Man. The person who gave him significance in life. Money. 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 Money was so powerful that when Jesus Christ resurrected, the, the soldiers at the tomb saw everything that happened. They saw the miracles. They saw angels. They experienced the earthquake. They saw the glory of God. 
But people said to them, tell people that the disciples came to steal him. And if anybody asks, or if, they, if, it, if you think you will get into trouble, we'll cover you up. Say, take this money. Go out and say this, that this is what happened. The moment they gave them money, they lied against their conscience. And because of those few soldiers, the Bible says up till today, as in when it was written, and I'm sure some Jews today, say up till today, that story was still believed in Israel. Why? Because in life, money is what finances ideas. Have you noticed that you've had some ideas and they have died? They're in your shelf. You, know, you just carry the jota, you see, 1999. <laughs> and nothing has happened to it. Because money is what finances ideas and dreams. It determines which idea will fly and which idea will not fly. It is not always the merit of your idea that makes it to fly. It is the finance that backs it up. It is the money that backs it up. Are you following me today? It is not the idea. It is the money, the merit of the idea. A wrong idea financed with a lot of money can defeat a good idea without money backing. Church people, when they start talking about money, you all look very, you know, like you, like you chew Nivaquin tablet. Is that true? That a good idea without money backing will be trumped, beaten, flawed, flogged, thrown away, thrown aside by a bad idea that is sponsored with money. And that's what happened with those soldiers. A bad message, a negative gospel, but it was sponsored by, with money and it, it shot the, the, the real story. Have you seen how the secular musician seems to fly higher than his Christian counterpart? Have you noticed? Have you noticed? The guy is singing, Lord, I love you. I honor you. Nobody's buying his CD. Holy Spirit, move me now. Who's moving you? Nobody's buying his CD. He goes to the road. He's trying to sell. Why? Because there's a prince of the power of the air. And ultimately, what is at stake is the message. It's not the musician. It's the message. That's what the devil is fighting. And the devil is fighting that because he has his own message. And his own message is sponsored. So you see, the, the, uh, the secular musician uh, is vulgar. He's talking about sex. He's corrupting our children. The women are almost half naked, shaking everything front and back all together. They're shaking and people are buying, going for the concert and all of that. It is because the devil is putting money behind his message. It's ultimately about the message. It's ultimately about the message. And you go, you, you look at TV today. Most programs now have the concept of homosexuality. NCIS, uh, Grey's Anatomy, they, they're just pushing those things. And you know what? Some of us cannot miss seeing those series. They know you will sit there. They know your children will be there. So they put those concepts there. How many of you have watched Ferdinand? That boo. Ferdinand. Ferdinand for children. Yeah, yeah. What do you think the message was about? He's just pushing homosexuality. Because you see this bull. A bull speaks of masculinity. Speaks of great strength. It's very big. Big horns. But he likes to play with flowers. If you've watched it. It's a message. It's a message. There's this one called Smallfoot. Who has seen Smallfoot too? Okay. Now animation. Smallfoot. You watch Smallfoot. They are targeted for our, to our children. Fantastically done. Amazing animation. Amazing animation. And what small food basically is teaching is that what if everything we've heard about God, everything we see in the Bible was just fable stories that were brought up to just make us behave well? If you've watched it, you'll understand the story. Okay, let me go to the popular one, Frozen. And the, and the message is very simple. Children, don't submit to authority. Aha, let it go. No right, no right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go. Let it go. Can't hold it back anymore. They put those messages there subliminally. They are passing those things. And if you watch the video very well, you can go back home and watch it. So up until that time, she was like this nice looking girl. And she had gone to this palace. And the moment she was saying, no right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. She removed her cloth. And then you see the hips. And then she began to really walk like this. Just go and check. Just go and check. And then this little nice looking girl becomes a paragon of beauty with the right statistics. And they are pushing a message. You look at Hotel Transylvania, pushing witchcraft and, and all of those things, saying it's all right. Just go and watch all of them. And a lot of money pumped behind these things. 
pumped behind these things. Because a good idea without money backing will fail, while a bad idea with money succeeds. My people said the soup that is sweet is a product of sufficient, sufficient money. Did you see the place we read? Solomon said, a wise man's wisdom, sorry, a poor man's wisdom is despised. Good idea. I've seen some Christian animation, Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus, or Samson. You see them, they walk like this. It looks as if the animation was, in, was done in 1925. So you are telling your children, watch the story of Samson. No, the child wants to watch Ferdinand. Wants to watch Frozen. Wants to watch all those nice ones. Why? Because money is not backing one up. And the devil knows. It's a message. Sometimes I feel sorry for the generation of our children. Because they've been exposed to things that we, things that we started being exposed to at maybe like 18, 16. Some of them are 6, they've been exposed to them. And it's money. It's money. Look at tall building, the tallest building. Every good thing you see around, the tallest building in the world, money. World Cup. You know how much goes into it? Money. 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 Believe it or not, in this world, the person who has economic power is the person who has real power. The person who has economic power is the person who has real power. In fact, money decides who rules us. It decides who is our governor, our president. And I'm not just talking about corruption and vote buying, but even normally, I was reading somewhere that in 2008, for Obama's campaign, they raised $750 million. $750 million. And they were projecting for his 2012 election that he may raise up to a billion. He may be needing about a billion dollars. How much is that in Naira? Just, you just put it on your calculator, then steam begins to come out of the calculator. Money. Very powerful. Very powerful. You may pray in tongues and quote scriptures. You may claim that you are free from all satanic bondages. But if you are not financially free, you are not yet free indeed. Jesus Christ said, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed, in totality. But if you are not financially free, you've not come to that point. Because the Bible says the borrower is a servant. He's a slave to the lender. He's a slave to the lender. You see that prophet in the book of 2 Kings that died. Some people say it was prophet Micaiah that, that, that died. And he, the inheritance he gave his family was Bese, was death. That was where he left for his family. And the man could not pay. All his lifetime, he could not pay. The wife could not pay. And the Bible says the creditor was coming to take their two sons to be servants. Because that is the destiny of everybody who ultimately is on the receiving end of life. Is on the broke end of life. And so you must... Uh, let me tell you this. It's not bragging, but it's just to talk. I remember when we got a house. And I said... And the first thing that, re, that occurred to me that... Wow, I'm no longer on the receiving end of life. I'm now on the end of life that I am collecting. That's a better end to be. Because the tenant now pays me. If house rent goes up, I don't complain again. I thank God. No, I want you to, like I said, it's not bragging. I want you to understand that principle. So there are things you are complaining. Oh, house rent. They have increased the house rent. It's because you're on the receiving end of life. So your, your desire, your strive, your push, your prayer, your, your practice of the covenant is to move you to the point where you are on the getting end of life. And you know, sometimes I just jokingly tell my wife that the next world that will come in, and I'll still try in this world, I'm going to have a school so that I'll collect school fees. I'm tired of paying school fees. I'm going to have houses. So I'm tired of paying house rent. I will receive house rent. Everything possible to be, and if I'll have a hospital, I'm telling you. So while some people are groaning, some people are smiling. Church people, I want you to listen to me today. While some people are groaning, some people are smiling. While you are saying hike in price, it, it means money in some people's pocket. And so you want to position yourself in such a way that you partake of that which comes because the borrower is a servant to the lender. 
Have you noticed that economy rules the world, not morality? It's not the good people. It's not the holy people that are ruling the world. It's not the people who pray in tongues. Look at TV. It's not the nice programs. It's not morality that runs this world. It is economy. He who signs the check. That's the person who has... The, that's where the power is. You may not like your boss. Unbeliever. Uns, you pray in the morning. God, that my boss, that uncircumcised Philistine. When you get to the office, you'll still kneel down to him. He signs the check. You'll still go and kill before him. So I'm shaking certain things. I want us to have certain understanding. Solomon said, money answers all things. Now, we know as believers that that is not totally true. But in this earth realm, why? Because as faith is a medium of exchange in the spirit realm, money is a medium of exchange in the physical realm. Without faith, it is impossible to receive anything from God. Without money, it is impossible to go to the shop and take something and go out without anybody holding you as a thief. As faith is a medium of exchange in the realm of the spirit, money is a medium of exchange in the physical realm. So until you know the morality of prosperity, you may not see a need to have money. And you'll always be limited. Until you know that there is a purpose. There is a message to be pushed. There is an agenda. For some of you, you should own TV stations. We can all complain. We can tell our children not to watch television. You know what? When they go to their friend's house, they will watch. You can tell them not to browse certain things or play certain games. They will play. So when are we going to start being the ones designing some softwares? When will we be the one building at TV stations? When are we going to have radio stations? When are we going to come up with programs that will push out there? Because we need to have an answer for everything that is going out there or going on out there. The Bible says we are the salt of the earth. And salt is of no use when it remains in the container. It must be applied. Now, God does not have a problem with giving you money. He doesn't just want the money to have you. He doesn't have a problem with you having money. God doesn't just want money to have you. Money should stay in your head, not in your heart. Amen? Amen? I know you don't like this topic. But the wise ones are learning. Now, let me just say this briefly. In the place we read in Deuteronomy, if you can put the good, good news version there, Deuteronomy 8.18. Uh, 8, God says, I am the one who gives you the power to get wealth. First of all, if wealth is not a good thing, God will not give you the power to get it. Can we, can we agree to that? God says, I am he that gives you the power to get wealth. And then the second thing in that place there, God says, it's because of a promise I made since. That's why I do it. It's because I'm trying to keep covenant. I'm trying to fulfill what I have said. In other words, until you come to that place, covenant has not been fulfilled. What I promised, you've not allowed me to be able to accomplish. It says, remember that it is the Lord your God who gives you the power to become rich. He does this because he is still faithful today to the covenant that he made with your ancestors. You saw in that place, he said to Abraham, I will bless you and I will go to your descendants and I will establish this covenant I'm making. I will establish it. And God says, this is how I'm going to establish it. I will give you the power to get wealth. I will give you the power to be rich. You know, some Christian mind will say, if God wanted to establish covenant, why didn't he come and say, I am the God who gives you beauty so I can establish the covenant. I am the God who gives you holiness so I can establish the covenant. I am the God who gives you the power to cast out demons so, you can, so, I'm, so I can establish the covenant. He says, no, I give you the power to become rich so I can establish the covenant. So riches ultimately are to establish the covenant of God. Why God gives us money is to establish his presence, is to establish his purpose, is to advance his kingdom, is to propagate his message. It is about covenant. It is about the promise to Abraham. The Bible says in Abraham, all the families of the world will be blessed. Without money, that will not happen. Without money, the world will not hear the gospel. Now, I may say this later, but let me say now, the gospel is free, mind you. I'm not saying we pay, we pay for the gospel. The gospel is free. 
But the process and the progress and the movement of the, of the gospel is not free. It's not free. It's not free. In fact, in Galatians chapter 3, 8, if they can put it there. God, it's, it's interesting. The Bible says ahead of time, God went to Abraham and preached the gospel. This gospel, look at what gospel God preached to Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God will justify the Gentiles. God saw this way during Abraham's time. He went ahead and preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, in you, all the nations shall be blessed. It was connected to the blessing. It says, this was the gospel that God, the message that God preached to Abraham. He says, the Gentiles will be justified through you. And of course, if you go down in verse 27, the last verse in this Galatians 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to that promise. That as you are in Christ, you have connected to that promise. So God expects you to be financially healthy, wealthy, and strong. Now, mind you, this does not mean that we'll all become rich. But what God basically says is that it will supply every need. No need will make you to be going around begging. I have a long way to go. Okay, let me see what I can do. Now, I'll tell you certain, just common sense, common sense uh, things that you need to know about money. Because I've come to realize that your financial prosperity, listen to this, your financial prosperity is a function of your financial literacy. Your financial prosperity is a direct function of your financial literacy. Many people are poor today and many people are rich today because there's something the rich know that the poor don't know. In fact, there's a book I was reading once and the man said, people will come to me and say, what is the best investment, you know? And maybe I'll talk about that during investment. And you know, many of us, we like to know, what is the best? Is it Tianxi gold? Is it um, Bitcoin? Is it uh, this? Is it that? What's the best investment? He said, the best investment is the one you are knowledgeable about. Because in those businesses that are collapsing, some people are making money from it. Why? Because they know the workings. We heard last week that God showed his acts to the children of Israel, but Moses knew the ways. He knew how it worked. So it's a function of your financial literacy. And if you are ignorant about money, you will remain in a place of lack perpetually. There are certain things you must know about money. In fact, let me tell you this. I was reading a book... Uh, this same book some time ago and I began to understand the principle of assets and liabilities and I'll be able to talk about that and you know what just from that book I increased my income I did certain things that brought more money to me maybe I'll be at liberty to share that later just from understanding the Bible says in all your gettings get wisdom just understanding that that there are certain things we call assets but they're actually liabilities just making that adjustment income increased now, let me mention a few common sense information about money. God did not create money. He doesn't need it to do what he wants. He never lacks it to do what he wants, however. He doesn't need it to do what he wants, yet he will not lack it to do what he wants. So, ultimately in life, money follows purpose. Money follows purpose. His will is his bill. God will only pay for what he has asked you to do. So you want to be wealthy, begin to find out, God, what am I supposed to do? Because his will is his bill. Now, this is straightforward. Money doesn't come in response to answer to, in answer to prayers or in response to prayers. Money doesn't come in response to fasting. Or else, Dangote won't have the kind of money he has. So it answers to practicing certain principles, like we heard, exchange of value. And also practicing God's covenant. We'll talk about some of those things later. Now, you can't disrespect money and expect money. Number three, you can't disrespect money and expect money. Money does not go to people who disrespect it or who waste it, who squander it. The Bible says there's desirable treasure in the dwelling of a, of a righteous man or something, but, but through waste, it loses everything or something like that. It loses everything through waste. Now, people who badmouth the rich people, all those rich people, they have stolen money. They are this. They are that. They are, don't be in that company. So if you badmouth the rich people, who are you? Are you a poor person? We are the rich people. 
We may not have it yet, but we are. So be mindful and don't jump to conclusions because, yeah, there are people like that, but most people are doing things right and they are living right and making money. So shut your mouth and do your part. Number four, he who goes a borrowing goes a sorrowing. We heard that growing up. Live within your means. Delay gratification. Number five. Listen to this. Everybody must hear this. Your present spending and saving habit, your present spending habit and saving habit are a prophecy of your financial destiny. You want to know how I'll be financially tomorrow? Check your sp present spending and saving habit. Number six. People who make the pursuit of money, their primary ambition in life, often don't get it. And when they get it, because some do, when they get it, it comes at the expense of certain valuable things in their lives. Some of them lose relationships. They lose their children. They lose, when I say lose their children, not die. They just lose that relationship. Their, their children are gone before they come back. So those who pursue money, ultimately, they, they make that their primary pursuit in life often don't get it. And if they get it, it comes at the cost of valuable things and relationships in their lives. Number seven, the Bible says this, money is uncertain. Money is uncertain. I've seen rich people become poor. I've seen poor people become rich. The Bible says money can develop wings and fly away. And so we must not put our trust in it. Naked we came, naked we will return. Number eight, I said this to the leaders, I think, two weeks ago. I said, your wealth will most likely come through people. Most of the wealth you will make will come through people. So, your relationship with people is important. Your interactions with people, important, important, important. People are your greatest wealth. And so, you must be mindful of people, how you treat people. And that's why, you know, today the world is moving towards customer service. Because they've realized the customer is king. And lastly... Money can buy you love, can buy you happiness. How many of you know that song? The old school boys. Money can buy you love, it can buy you happiness, can buy you a good marriage, it can buy you godly children, it can get you a big house, it can get you a big home, it can get you married, but it can't give you a happy marriage. Money, it has its limitations. So I'll just stand there by the grace of God and read. <laughs> I submit to you that you are not poor. Somebody say, I'm not poor. Your wealth is not from around you. Your wealth is within you. So birth it. Create it. Do not measure your prosperity by how much you have in your bank account, but by how much you have in your mind account. Are you listening to me? Don't measure your prosperity by how much you have in your bank account, but by how much you have in your mind account. True wealth is intangible. If you think it is in material things, you will miss it. All that God used to create the world was not money. They were the thoughts in his mind, in his spirit that he brought forth. Not money, not money, not money. The Bible says as he thinks in his mind, so he is. So the greatest investment you will make in your journey to financial prosperity is investment in your mind. Like I said, just about a chapter in a book brought more money in the hundreds of thousands to me. Just a few chapters. So the greatest investment will be in your mind. The reason Nigeria is one of the poorest nations in the world is because we are focused on tangible wealth. What does it drive? How much does it? We even keep money in our houses, in septic tanks, in wells, in coffins. Nigerians. So although we have a lot of natural resources, we are still one of the poorest, maybe if not the poorest nation. In the world. Someone once said that nations do not become great by virtue of their wealth, but by the wealth of their virtues. Nations don't become great by the virtue that is because of their wealth, but by the wealth of their virtues, of their principles, of their policies, of their values. That's ultimately what creates wealth. In Africa, in Nigeria especially, just check. Look at what we invest in. We have abandoned education at every level. And what's happening? We are not investing in the mind. And it will play out down the road. Because that's where real prosperity is. 
A mind invented everything you see today. A mind came up with Facebook. A mind came up with architecture, with law. With, some minds came up with almost everything we see. So if you are not investing in the minds of our young ones, imagine what our tomorrow will be like. And so sometimes the greatest investment in your children is not to buy them a house because I've realized that sometimes <laughs> you may lose it. Have you noticed, I always like to say jokingly, but then maybe it is true. Abraham, the Bible says, was rich in gold, rich in cattle, rich in silver, rich in men's servants, rich in female servants, rich in all kinds of things. But his son Isaac had to walk. There was famine in the land. He was digging wells. Ha! Huh? What happened to his father's wealth? I don't think it found its way into his hand. And then Isaac became rich too. The Bible says he began to prosper, continued to prosper, and became very prosperous. And then Jacob went to do houseboy. And you're like, are you not the son of this wealthy man? Because for those people, they realize that what we give our children is not what we have amassed. What they gave their children was a blessing. He spoke over and said, my son, you are blessed. You shall eat of the dew of the heavens, of the fatness of the earth. And that word upon his mind produced everything in his life. And so we must understand as a nation and as individuals. And of course, you see in countries that are developed... What are they investing in? The minds of the people. In fact, they have so understood the intangibility of prosperity that right now, they patent ideas. It's just in your head. You get, you get property. What do they call it now? Uh, intellectual rights for it. Intellectual property. They call it your intellectual property. And they pay you for it. And it's not a house. So you may have it in your mind. You may have it in your head. But you can sell it. It doesn't have to be a house on ground. It doesn't have to be a land somewhere in the bush. It doesn't have to be a bar of gold. Just in the mind. And they have come to realize that. That the wealth in the mind sometimes is greater than the wealth in the pocket. Now, ending where I started, or where I said somewhere in the middle. The Bible in Ecclesiastes 2.26 says that um, uh, God has given the wicked man, the unjust man, the task of gathering. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. So ultimately, our work is not to chase after money. I like to say that it is like shadow. Those who are running after it will not get it. Those who are running away from it, it will follow them. Jesus Christ says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. So God says some people are gathering right now, but the objective, the assignment for some of them is that I'm just looking for that man who is good, who is upright before me. And there's going to be a transfer. And of course, I know Christians, we didn't understand before. We think transfer of wealth just will be in our house and one rich man will just knock on your door. Bam, 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 bam. Who is that? I am Aliko Dangote. Praise the Lord. He opened the door. He said, I don't know, but I had a dream that I should move a billion naira to your house today. No, that's not how wealth is going to be transferred. There will be transfer of wealth, but we must position ourselves for them. Through the value we create, through the engagement, through the covenant that we practice. So God says, somebody is gathering right now, and I'm looking for that good person. Who will use it to advance my cause? Who will use it and put it behind the message? Who will use it to bless the people? Who, when it comes into their hands, the city will rejoice. That is the purpose of God for wealth. That is the purpose of God for wealth. So don't just be quick to pray for God's work in your church. Say to God, empower me to empower the message. To put money behind it. God told me once that God's people have all of God's properties for all of God's projects. And so we must release it. The world will not support the cause of God. Do you understand that? The world, they will not put money in any preaching of the gospel. La, rarely will Aliko Dangote with all his billions come and say, Oh, you're a preacher of the gospel. I want this message to go to the northeast. Take a billion naira. Set up a camp for a crusade. Buy PA system. It will not happen. Rarely will that happen. 
And I say that to also, let me step on the foot or the feet of some Christians or the toes of some Christians. I said that to also say that our primary assignment as believers is not to take food to the orphanage. Some of us think that that is our Christian duty. United Nations will, is doing that. All these donor agencies or whatever, Bill Gates, Melinda, they are doing that. They will not put their money in the gospel. They will not. So if we also go there, we are putting what should be for the gospel there. Now, it is not wrong to do that because the Bible says those who have believed God should be fruitful in good works. But ultimately, it should not be our objective. It should be a vehicle so that when we go to the orphanage, we are going with the message as we give the indomie. Don't give them the indomie noodle and feel they have done a Christian duty. And you know, you have satisfied yourself. Nobody has eaten indomie and, went to, and gone to heaven. Indomie never takes anybody to heaven. Taking relief materials never takes anybody to heaven. People will do it. And agencies are doing that. And these agencies won't give a cobble. To fulfill the purpose of God or to advance the kingdom of God. So let us be balanced. Let us be balanced. So I'm not saying it is bad to do that. I give out, I do charities too. But you know what? The message is more important. Because giving blanket to somebody who has experienced flood, he will be warm. But he won't take him to heaven. And some people will say, uh, and, and this is not scriptural exegesis. There will be time for that. Matthew 25. And on the last day, he will sit down. And call the goats, put them on the right. And call the sheep, the sheep on the right. And the goat on the left. And he will say to the sheep, I was hungry, you fed me. I was this and you I enter into the joy of your father. And some Christians, some Christians will say it is on the basis of those that will go to heaven. Then why did Jesus die? If we continue like that, we have gone into a false religion. Religion of works. Because there are religions that believe that it is in giving things to the underprivileged that takes them to heaven. So we are, we are being seduced into that. So it's an end time to the joy of your father. And they stay strong on it. But if you take that same scripture and go to the beginning of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus Christ told three great parables there. He says there was a wedding party and there were ten virgins. Ten were, five were, were wise, five were foolish. Five didn't have oil in their lamps. And when the Bridegroom came, they were locked out. He said, let them go into outer darkness. Is, are we going to enter heaven because we'll have oil in our lanterns? Maybe Jesus is not talking about heaven. Maybe not. I'm just saying, I'm just giving us food to think, food for thought. And then after that, he said a great man was going to travel. He called his servants, gave them talents. And one didn't trade with his talents. He said, take the talent from him. Cast him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing or gnashing of teeth. Is that heaven he's talking about or hell? And then he now comes, I will say to the sheep, to the, you know, so we just take that. So we must be careful because ultimately it is the message. I think Psalm 68, 11, I'm not sure. He said, the Lord gave the word and great was the company of those. God is looking for a great company that will go out and push it and push it and push it. The great, great day of company, I think it's Savar, where you get a host. In the Lord of hosts. Say a great host went out pushing it. Pushing the gospel. Pushing the gospel. Talk a little more about that. I end today in Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 13. Chapter 5 verse 13. Say there is a severe evil which I have seen under the sun. Riches kept for their owner to his hurt. A severe, a severe evil I have seen under the sun. Riches kept for their owner to his hurt. 14. But those riches perish through misfortune. And when he begets a son, there is nothing in his hand. And 15. As he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. I already gave us the examples of the patriarchs. He said, it's an evil I've seen under the sun. A man labors, gathers, he said, when he has a son, there's nothing in his hand to give to the son. He said, all of us, as we all came, it's good to have money, but that's not the ultimate. That is definitely not the ultimate. Because we came naked, we'll return naked. Nobody will take a cobble with them. 